Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Our webinar is entitled Lifestyle Medicine and the Methylome. Our speaker is Dr. Kara Fitzgerald. My name is Dr. Lenore Powell. I'm a medical education specialist in Genova's Atlanta branch. I will serve today as the moderator. We would like to welcome Dr. Kara Fitzgerald. Dr. Fitzgerald received her Doctor of Naturopathic Medicine degree from the National University of Natural Medicine in Portland, Oregon. She completed the first Council on Naturopathic Medicine accredited postdoctorate position in nutritional biochemistry and laboratory science at Medimetric Clinical Laboratory, which is now Genova Diagnostics, under the direction of Dr. Richard Lord. Her residency was completed at Progressive Medical Center, which is a large integrative medical practice here in Atlanta, Georgia. Dr. Fitzgerald is the lead author and editor of Case Studies in Integrative and Functional Medicine, and she is a contributing author to Laboratory Evaluations for Integrative and Functional Medicine and the Institute for Functional Medicine Textbook for Functional Medicine. Most recently, with Romilly Hodges, she authored the ebook, The Methylation Diet and Lifestyle. Dr. Fitzgerald is actively engaged in clinical research on the methylome using diet and lifestyle interventions in conjunction with the Health Dot Research Institute. She is a research clinician for the Institute for Therapeutic Discovery. Dr. Fitzgerald is also on the faculty at IFM. She's an IFM certified practitioner and lectures globally on functional medicine. She runs a functional medicine clinic emergent program for professionals and maintains a podcast series. New Frontiers in Functional Medicine, and an active blog on her website, www.drkarafitzgerald.com. That is www.drkarafitzgerald.com. Her clinical practice is in Sandy Hook, Connecticut. You will have access to the presentation and the slide deck on our website within a few days after the webinar. You can access these resources, previous webinar recordings, brief visual modules, and other materials by clicking the Clinician's tab on the home page. So I'm going to turn over the role of presenter to Dr. Kara Fitzgerald. Hey, everybody. It is lovely to be here with you. Let me just get my um, presentation rolling. All right. Can you see that? We can see your screen just well. Okay, perfect. Um, it's just, it's always nice to uh, connect with Genova. You know, just as you said in my um, bio there, I have a lot of love for the lab. It's where I did my postdoctorate as Metametrics under the direction of Richard Lord. And, you know, indeed, it's where we, you know, I first was exposed to um, methylation actually going way back in my in my interview, in my, you know, coming from school, my, my first interview with Dr. Lord, he was very interested at that time in, to, in the implications of low homocysteine and what that could do, um, specifically related to it being um, part of the tripeptide of glutathione and, and insufficient glutathione. Anyway, we ended up writing a white paper on it, I think in 2006 or so. Um, but so from the get-go at the lab, I was thinking about methylation. Uh, you know, flash forward a decade plus, and I began to read literature on uh, epigenetics, you know, that we're in the omics, we're in the midst of the omics revolution since um, the human genome has been mapped and we're, we're, we're looking at um, all sorts of really high throughput uh, information related to genetic expression and epigenetics is, is one of that, one of that, uh, uh, one of that investigation and, and an area that I've been particularly interested in. Uh, so it was at that time, maybe 2012, 2013, that I started to read about um, DNA methylation, one of the key epigenetic marks. And uh, it struck me. So what really struck me about this, about DNA methylation, was the potential for, depending on region of of the DNA, hyper and hypomethylation. So in, 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 in somebody's, in a single individual's genome, there could be regions of hypermethylation activity as well as hypomethylation. Um, and balancing that expression is, uh, 
in my mind, in my read on the literature, really kind of where it's at. Um, and I'm going to talk about the background there. Um, coming from thinking about methylation, uh, the methylation cycle, the methylation and sulfuration interactions, by and large, I've been pushing methylation forward, supplying methyl donors um, to my patients and, you know, lowering homocysteine and so forth. Now I'm really moving towards a much more nuanced uh, approach to methylation in general. So let me just jump in. I've got a lot of slides to go through. Um, here's our objectives. Hopefully I'll meet these. Any questions that you have, I'm going to have some time at the end. You'll be able to access me after this presentation. Lenora knows how to find me, so, um, or you can always go over to the website, leave, leave questions for me there. I want to make myself available because I do think this content is not only interesting, but really important. So there's a methyl group. You can see it's a carbon and three hydrogens. Extremely simple molecule. Um, and you're familiar with methylation reactions. Arguably, functional medicine clinicians, integrative medicine clinicians, we're just, we're pretty biochemically savvy. We know methylation, we know the methylation cycle, the folate vitamin cycle, sulfuration, and so forth. Um, so it's the formation and the transfer of methyl groups, and we're doing it all over the place. Um, Backstory, if anybody's interested in the in the history, it was uh, we, Wilhelm Hiss in 1887 discovered that we uh, we could methylate. He actually measured methylated metabolites in dogs' urine when he exposed them to a certain drug. Uh, but then it wasn't until 1953 that Cantoni actually identified um, S-adenosylmethionine, and the actual methylation cycle started to be characterized. And here's S adenosylmethionine, the universal methyl donor. Uh, and again, I know you know this well. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time here, um, but this is the methylation cycle interfacing with a folate vitamin cycle. Um, and then again, homocysteine is the switch between methylation and sulfuration. And we get in here, actually. Let me just say, you know, we're good at getting in here. Let me go back, you know, and, and, and supporting it and investigating it. Uh, we know the micronutrients needed to keep, keep it humming. We know how to, you know, measure single nucleotide polymorphisms in a host of, of uh, the genes here. I think we are really quite good at it. And I'm excited about the new Genova methylation panel. Um, they have widened the lens. So back in the day, we had homocysteine we could look at, we could look at sarcosine, we, so we could look at um, different amino acids that were either precursors to methylation steps or products of methylation reactions. And we really sort of danced around it to the best of our ability, but they've drilled down and, and added some important markers to get an idea of what's happening with methylation. They've added SAM, um, saw, they've got the ratio, they have choline, betaine, DMG. So it's, I'm, I'm pretty excited about it. And then they've coupled it with some of the um, common SNPs and some of the transsulfuration products. So uh, good job on this. And arguably, you know, in terms of assessing methylation, even genetic methylation, right now, these are the well, this will always be an important tool in our kit, um, and we don't have epigenetic um, assessments available to us yet. So right now, these are our surrogate markers for, identif for, for, for investigating epigenetic activity. Um, all right. As of last count, this, study, this paper came out in 2011, the human methyl transferase transferome. Uh, there are 208 identified uh, methyltransferase enzymes. Some of them are um, not well understood as to you know, what they're doing in the body. Some of them are very well understood, like catechol methyltransferase. So the methyltransferome is really, it's, it's big and continues to grow or we continue to actually characterize uh, different enzymes. Methylation. So, you know, thinking about just uh, evolution, you know, the simple molecule, a carbon and three hydrogens. I mean, our, we, we really evolved to use it in, um, you know, a wide variety of ways and very important uh, roles it plays in the body. And I have to think it, it, it must be because of the ubiquity of, of carbon and, and hydrogen, but it's just an interesting thing for me to ponder. So here's a handful of methylation uses, and I just want to 
point out to you the fact that um, not only do we synthesize DNA, three of the four DNA nucleotides require functioning methylation cycle, but we repair DNA and then we regulate DNA expression, actually beyond DNA, RNA expression, you know, histone. So genetic expression uh, requires functioning methylation. You can see phospholipid uh, synthesis or det detoxification, neurotransmitter synthesis, um, phosphocreatine system, you know, and on and on. It's just in the cycle is incredibly important that it's functioning and that it's, you know, that we have adequate reserves. Here's a DNA methylation. So DNA methyltransferase enzymes, just like any other methyltransferase enzyme, it's just taking SAM, it's taking that methyl group from SAM, and, it, and in this case, it pops it onto cytosine um, at the fifth position. So this is cytosine becoming 5-methyl cytosine. And DNA methylation happens by and large at cytosine when it's um, next to guanine. So it's a CPG site, they call it, and that's phosphate. That P stands for phosphate. In general, um, adding methyl groups onto, onto CPGs uh, silences genetic expression. Okay, and it, but there's, you know, there's a continuum. The amount of methyl groups on a particular promoter region of a gene will kind of dictate how on or how off it is. But in general, and you can think visually, actually just looking at this image, you, you can see that lollipop of a methyl group sticking out. You can see how it would inhibit structurally, you know, transcription factors from landing on the DNA and allowing it to be, um, you know, unwound. Methylation, this is a, you know, this is a, a interesting quote, and I think it's probably true. I haven't really been able to chase it down solidly, but methylation is happening in every cell all of the time. I think it's so fundamental that something to that effect is, is likely, and thus we need to tend to it. For the sake of my conversation, or actually my one-way conversation with you today, I'm just going to distinguish two areas. Um, there's metabolic methylation or the methylation cycle and, you know, all the peripheral activity that's happening outside of the genome. So COMT doing its thing and metabolizing estrogens or, you know, actually making SAMe in the methylation cycle and so forth. So I'm, I'm going to consider that metabolic. And then by and large today, I'm going to focus on epigenetic uh, and specifically DNA uh, methylation. The reason that I'm going to spend time on DNA, there are other um, gen uh, genetic methylation uh, processes occurring, but DNA is the most resilient. Um, it's through DNA me methylation that these epigenetic heritable um, uh, phenomena can happen and so forth. So I, th I, I think that it's um, you know, just my read on the literature, uh, it's, it's one of the most, more important epigenetic processes. So understanding the human methylome. Uh, epigenetic expression is understood now to um, really have a strong potential to modify disease, uh, improve health span or compromise health span, depending on what it looks like, light and lifespan. Um, I think that probably our best approach to tending to healthy methylation, um, healthy methylome expression is an upstream dietary and lifestyle approach um, and less aggressive, uh, perhaps, supplement slash medi medical approach. DNA methylation is uh, highly regulated, many marks are stable. So that that little methyl group, that lollipop on that on the cytosine, um, can be lasting. But there's a continuum. Uh, there's some malleability. The reason it can be stable actually is because when DNA is um, when, the, when, when a, a daughter strand of DNA is produced, the methylation marks on, that, on the template strand can actually be, be transferred over to the daughter strand. And for that reason, during reproduction, those marks can be really quite stable. Um, however, under circumstances, they're changeable. You know, an example of a stable DNA mark would be, um, DNA methylation mark would be uh, 
the X chromosome. So differentiating, you know, just activating one X chromosome in females, that's shut down via methylation. Stem cell differentiation, extremely important. Um, that's dictated through different DNA methylation uh, patterns. DNA methylation is, you know, for that reason, for, you know, stem cell differentiation and, and, and other important activities is highly favored at embryogenesis. Um, what else? We do, we do methylate uh, at histones, RNA. There's mitochondrial DNA that has its own collection of mitochondrial DNA methyltransferase enzymes. We also actively demethylate as well. So one of the ways we can alter um, what's going on at the, at, the, at the methylome is through active demethylation. 1011 translocation enzymes, there's three of them identified, and they can clean up DNA methylation marks. Uh, so understanding that, let me just, a little bit of the backstory, uh, as we age, globally, if we look at all of our DNA together, we'll see that it's, um, it becomes less methylated. And that correlates, so we can see an inverse correlation with homocysteine. So as we age, we can see homocysteine rise, but the, and then if you look at the methylome, you'll see that, you know, globally, there's a decrease in overall methylation. So our methylation activity as we age actually kind of grind, it doesn't grind to a halt, but it becomes kind of imbalanced. And then if you zoom in and look at specific regions, specific genes, you can see that some are hypomethylated and therefore on, and some are really pretty um, hypermethylated and inhibited. And when we look at certain diseases, diseases of, uh, you know, chronic diseases of aging, we can see this aberrant or this imbalanced DNA methylation. And most famously, we see this in cancer, where key tumor suppressor genes can be uh, hypermethylated and turned off. And so for, for that reason, we want to think about um, supporting healthy and balanced DNA methylation, not just pushing it forward, but also making sure demethylation is, uh, we've got the nutrients in store for healthy demethylation activity as well. And here's the, the cycle of methylation and demethylation. So the D, DNA methyltransferase and then the uh, 1011 translocase enzymes. Aberrant DNA um, methylation as an underlying cause of disease, um, part of the mechanism of disease, and as well as a consequence of disease. I'm just going to give you some of the evidence for this idea. Most famously, and what caught my attention is DNA methylation imbalances um, and cancer. Uh, widespread tumor suppressor genes are hypermethylated and turned off. We see this with, if you look at the CARF uh, citation from 2013, um, BRCA genes. So we, we're, we're well aware of BRCA mutations and the negative, inf you know, the, the, the likelihood of cancer. If you have a BRCA mutation, um, but they can also become hypermethylated and uh, in so doing, they're associated with an increased risk of hormone-sensitive cancers. Hypermethylation of glutathione S transferase, if you look at Yang and Park from 2012 in the bottom, uh, so glutathione S transferase, interestingly enough, is, behaves as a tumor suppressor gene, particularly in prostate cancer. That's where a lot of the research has been. Um, and it can also be hypermethylated and its activity inhibited. Here's a, uh, this is an Illumina uh, array. This is looking at um, the epigenome. So 450,000 CPG sites looking at methylation patterns on, on, on DNA. And you can see the legend there that the more yellow it is, the more methylated it is. So the, uh, the bottom row there, the big yellow band, those are cancer cell lines. Again, we're looking at tumor suppressor genes really being hypermethylated and inhibited. Interestingly, though, if you look, uh, you know, if you look at oncogenes that are in, incorporated into DNA, those can actually be hypomethylated and on. The tumor microenvironment is, you know, pretty 
sophisticated at hijacking um, the epigenetic machinery and sort of using it. You know, this was again one of my one of my original questions. If I'm pushing methylation forward in my patients with with the the myriad methyl donors that I'm routinely prescribing, uh, and there's some tumor activity, you know, is that something I need to be mindful of? Could I be you know, could I be pushing it forward? Demethylating agents are used in cancer and many of them are in drug development. I mean, this is a big area and it's not surprising. Um, there are some old demethylating drugs that are still in use. They're pretty nonspecific. So they're not just gonna be demethylating the tumor suppressor genes. They're gonna have a widespread influence, you know, inhibiting methylation. And again, going back to that earlier slide I presented with the widespread uh, activity that, you know, methylation is involved in. You can imagine that the side effects associated with some of these demethylating agents are really, really problematic. DNA methylation and other diseases. If there, this area interests you at all, um, there's, it's just a hotbed of exciting research um, just bursting forth. And you'll see, you know, this aberrant methylation is, is, is happening in, you know, all of the chronic diseases that we're thinking about in our practice. That first 2017 study um, looking at, um, interestingly enough, hypermethylation of ApoE4 in late onset Alzheimer's disease. Um, you can see below that, we're looking at aberrant methylation patterns in um, hypertension and uh, major depression, atherosclerosis, and it's just, it, it's on and on. You can dig pretty deep in the literature. This is a, this was a review article um, published in 2018, looking at um, aberrant methylation patterns in um, autoimmunity. Now, if, you're, if you've been thinking about epigenetics at all, you're probably aware of the fact that we can inherit, um, and this is non-genetically, so the genome itself hasn't been altered, but the epigenetic marks and genetic expression you know, can be inherited. It's really pretty extraordinary, and you're, you're, you're likely aware of some of this. Uh, most famously is Dutch hunger winter, uh, this was a group of individuals in the Netherlands. They were shut off. So during World War II, the region of the Netherlands was shut off from food uh, supplies by the Germans, and they starved. Um, women who were pregnant at that time, um, particularly early, gave birth to offspring who had increased risk for obesity, cardiovascular disease, diabetes. And what's interesting about this, so not only was there a fetal influence uh, in response to the famine, but generationally they've tracked it. And you, there's a handful of studies looking at that. So you, you can see the negative influence of famine. But also what's interesting, if you look at the top there over calyx cohort, what they show is excess food was actually correlated with um, increased diabetes mortality in um, offspring. So both famine and excess, and in fact, the overcalyx showed um, that low food availability, but not quite starvation, was actually was shown uh, was associated with improved cardiovascular disease mortality or a reduced cardiovascular disease mortality. So it's interesting, insufficient, so famine uh, or excess, both problematic. A little bit of less food, but not famine, was beneficial, and we're. Uh, thinking about intermittent fasting and fasting mimicking diets now. And, you know, there are some shared mechanisms here for sure. Um, so other exposures can influence epigenetic expression. Well, again, you know, a famous one is Project Ice Storm. This is the work of Dr. Moshe Sev. He's up at McGill. Uh, so, so there was a massive ice storm up in Montreal in that in the Quebec area. And um, power was out for some individuals for up to 45 days. Women who were pregnant um, and experienced objective as well as subjective hardship uh, were shown to have, uh, offspring were shown to have DNA methylation changes. And those DNA methylation changes increased 
um, autism and increased allergic disease. So there was a, a clinically negative effect with this stress exposure, objective as well as subjective. Again, just circling back over to our, our cycle and um, wanting to, so we need the nutrients. I'm giving you this idea that we have to finesse it, um, but ultimately we do need to support with methyl donors. Um, and when you look at the literature around methyl donors in the diet, there's nothing to my read, with the exception of synthetic folic acid, it's, uh, there's no association with negative outcomes. So if you have lots of spinach or some liver and some of the other nutrients I'll talk about later, there's no association at this point with negative outcome of um, DNA methylation. But anyway, let me talk a little bit about manipulating maternal diet, um, intentionally manipulating maternal diet and outcome. Most famously, this is Waterland, the work of uh, Waterland and Jertle, first paper published in 2003. This is, of course, the Agouti mouse model. Uh, hopefully, some of you are are aware of it. Um, it's the most cited paper in the history of science. <laughs> it's pretty impressive. And I suspect these guys are hopefully going to get the Nobel at some point for their work. It's pretty extraordinary. So the Yaguti my mice are um, obese. They're large and they're blonde. Let me show you a picture. There's an Yaguti. Well, actually, both of these guys are, are, are Yaguti mice. The, the blonde obese one has the Yaguti gene on, so it's not methylated, it's on, and the right one has it off, and you can see it's a normal wild type brown mice, mouse. Um, so what these guys did brilliantly, the Agouti mouse is, you know, blonde and obese, and they thought, let's give them a methyl donor rich diet and see what happens. So they gave them their normal mouse chow and fortified it with additional methyl donors, and they shut down Agouti gene expression. So they hypermethylated and inhibited that Agouti gene, and the blonde Agouti mouse was now the normal sized um, wild type looking mouse, even though they're gen genetically identical. And the um, disease risk, so the Agouti mouse has, mouse model has increased risk for diabetes and cardiovascular disease and, and some other issues. And, and you just simply don't see that when you hypermethylate it and inhibit it. Um, these guys went on to do really interesting stuff. So Jertle's lab and, and the folks working at his lab went on to show that genistine had that same effect. So genistine is nowhere in the methylation cycle, but gen genistine potently influenced methylating the Agouti gene. Pretty, pretty interesting stuff. And this um, figures into what we're doing in our practice. These are, um, this, so genistine, we're kind of terming a methylation adaptogen. It has the ability to really potently augment um, epigenetic methylation activity without directly um, being a methyl donor itself. Uh, then they went on to um, uh, demonstrate that BPA exposure would allow for that agouti expression, but they could inhibit the BPA damage by either using methyl donors or um, genistein uh, supplementation. So BPA damage allows for the expression of the agouti gene. BPA exposure, excuse me. Um, the methyl donor diet can inhibit the BPA damage, um, or genistein can inhibit the BPA damage, and you know once again hypermethylate and inhibit the Goody gene. Behavioral programming. So early um, exposure to um, either contact or lack of contact can influence um, epigenetic uh, marks and, and, and a behavioral phenotype. So if you receive, um, if off, offspring receive maternal or um, fostering uh, attention, um, they'll have a healthier phenotype. Um, they'll have more stress resilience. You can actually see this in the glucocorticoid activities in the central nervous system. Um, this is again by the, the work of Dr. Moshe Saf up at McGill University. Whereas, and it doesn't matter, so biological mother or adoptive mother, it doesn't matter. It's just that early exposure 
um, or early lack of exposure will influence, you know, later behavioral phenotype. Um, there's me with my adopted daughter, Isabella James, and they're also showing similarly in um, adopted or maternal exposure um, in humans. So these same studies are being repeated, and it's something that I hope to look at, you know, in my in the study that I'm doing, I'm going to tell you about here in a second. Uh, we can absolutely influence DNA methylation at other stages. So it's not just, you know, gametogenesis, embryogenesis, um, you know, in utero shifts. Uh, we know that we can um, provide methyl donors lower homocysteine, and actually that's been associated with favorably altering um, global DNA methylation. Um, we also know that we can use things, again, you know, like the animal studies demonstrated, other than specific methyl donors, and they'll augment DNA methylation as well. So the two uh, bottom references are looking at a Mediterranean diet, looking at fish oil, uh, both having um, influence on DNA methylation activity. Now, these guys, here's a bunch of polyphenols that we're really in love with that have active epigenetic effects. This particular paper from 2010 is looking at epigenetic effects on cancer. Um, so again, looking at tumor suppressor genes by and large and the ability to, these nutrients have an ability to allow for the re-expression of previously inhibited tumor suppressor genes um, by a variety of mechanisms. Um, so you can see uh, from parsley, you can see um, uh, garlic, curcumin, uh, you can see EGCG, just kind of a lot of the nutrients we know and love and use in our patients routinely, but especially in our cancer patients, you can see that they've got this, you know, our, just potent um, epigenetic modifying potential. It's just, it's really exciting stuff for me. Uh, and I, you know, and I think as more research comes out, we're probably going to see that this is one of the major anti-cancer mechanisms of these nutrients we've been using for time immemorial. You know, so genistein. Now, genistein in adults seems to have a methyltransferase inhibitor potential, whereas if you go back to the Agouti model, the, 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 that in utero genistein exposure actually allowed to uh, shut down Agouti. So it's like it allows for re-expression of certain genes, but then in utero exposure in the animal model, it actually inhibited. So that's a that's sort of a true definition of an ad, of an adaptogen. Um, lycopene from tomatoes, resveratrol, silymarin, sulforaphane, uh, diendolmethane, again, all potent, potent, uh, what we're calling methylation adaptogens. This is a pretty cool study. It's an animal model, but looking at diendolmethane um, inhibiting allowing for the re-expression of NERF2, actually inhibiting inflammation by um, allowing for the re-expression of NERF2, which then goes on to inhibit um, NF-kappa-B, and then showing actually a lower incidence of tumorigenesis, and uh, specifically prostate cancer. And this is DNA methylation in flavonoids and genitourinary cancer. Um, I know the glutathione S transferase here was particularly interesting to me, but there's just a host of, of these um, adaptogens. What else do we have? Environmental factors, as you can imagine, have huge effects on the DNA methylome. Um, what do I want to say? Uh, you can see, if you look at the bottom bullet there, long-term Tai Chi <laughs> preserved age-related global DNA methylation loss. So just the long-term habit of Tai Chi uh, was really remarkably um, beneficial. Conversely, we see that toxins can influence DNA methylation activity. And there's a, this is a lecture unto itself. There's a number of diff different mechanisms by which uh, toxins can influence. Um, and these are metallotoxins like lead, mercury, but also um, organotoxins, pesticides, benzene, BPAs, on, and, and on. And it's not just inhibiting, you know, direct um, methylation activity, but damaging DNA, increasing oxidative stress, and all of those secondary mechanisms will then uh, influence epigenetics. What else do we have here? Exercise. So exercise in, is an incredibly important um, 
DNA methylation nutrient when it's done in a balanced way. Um, Overexercise, however, can actually have a negative. Underexercise, overexercise. So there's a sweet spot for, of exercise for a given individual, and the research suggests that that it is profoundly important for healthy um, DNA methylation. Uh, likewise with sleep. Uh, sleep deprivation. There's some interesting research uh, originally just in animals. A lot of a lot of this stuff is, you know, for a long time been in animals only because it's so new. But we're seeing more and more human stuff come out, um, and you know, the negative influence of sleep deprivation on DNA methylation is um, is is becoming clearer. Again, here's some exercise and sleep deprivation. Uh, all of these, you'll have access to this, so anything you want to do the drill down and you'll see the citations. Um, if, hopefully somebody caught the news on the twin studies. This is just incredibly interesting. These guys are identical twins. They're the only identical twin astronauts. Uh, Scott went out, was in outer space for a year. Mark stayed home. They tested them every which way before they left and then tested them again. Um, one of the big headlines was NASA twins no longer identical after space flight alters DNA. I think that's really funny. But the fact of the matter is, after his year in space, Scott's um, methylome was very different than his brother's. Actually, there were a number of different measurements, uh, the, the number of measurements that had changed, like his telomere length was much, you know, much longer. So he was a lot younger than, than Mark uh, using that measurement, um, although it normalized over a few days. So one of the interesting things that they showed in this study were that a lot of those changes, a lot of the, the methylation changes actually restored to baseline, but some of them didn't. So again, it's that, um, you know, it's the ability, the, the resilient methylation changes, but but there's also some malleability, and we're still really kind of sorting out the where and the why of that. So very stable changes, again, X chromosome inactivation, <coughs> transgenerational inheritance can be stable, although it's also excuse me, it's also changeable. And then there are other regions that are much more labile um, from hours to perhaps days, weeks, months. And here's the continuum. So, you know, this is, you know, methylation is not just, it's not an all or nothing phenomena. Um, there's a continuum of methylation and how active a gene can be. Um, and we can measure that. Again, just looking at the BRCA. Um, hypermethylation of BRCA and MGMT is also a tumor suppressor gene that can be inherited, um, unfortunately. But arguably, we, we've got this good arsenal of um, polyphenols that we can use to <coughs> help for re-expression. Excuse me. This is looking at genistein um, in preventing uh, BRCA hypermethylation. And this is a cell study, by the way. It's not That's not a human trial. Microbial impact, you know, of course, gut bugs have a huge role to play in healthy methylation activity, not just in making folate or, or, or helping with B12 absorption, although those are significant. Um, <clears throat> they seem to be able to augment DNA, expression, DNA methylation expression, you know, beyond just the production of nutrients. So with that in mind, you know, as I dove into the into the science behind it, um, it radically changed the way that um, that I practice. <clears throat> I, as you know, somebody who um, I was not shy with a more aggressive approach to my patients, you know, higher dose methyl donors when I thought um, that clinical presentation or and and you know combined with laboratory data warranted. Um, looking at the potential, looking at this nuanced activity on the methylome, you know, just prompted me to kind of stop in my tracks and, and, and want to catch a much wider net. So this whole methylation diet and lifestyle journey really started out with the simple question of, you know, how can I do right by my patients here? Um, and Romilly, my nutrition director here at our, our clinic, she and I began really endless dialogues around that and 
we started to pour through the literature and it became clear that we needed to build out a dietary program. Um, and she's worked on that. We also have a large nutrition residency uh, program here and, and our residents hopped in and, and really helped to um, comb through the data and figure out <clears throat> the methylation diet. Um, and then we combed through the literature looking at um, different lifestyle interventions and their influence on, on methylation again and thought about exercise and sleep and meditation and you know, reducing toxin exposure and on and on. And we came up with this, our, what we're calling our methylation uh, matrix. And these are all, you know, again, based on our exploration of the literature, uh, important areas to address in our patients um, for optimizing epigenetic expression. So again, well beyond um, tweaking the methylation and sulfuration cycles um, to just, you know, casting a wide net, um, giving the healthiest inputs, you know, removing the unhealthy exposures and really kind of allowing the body wisdom with correct inputs to make decisions on um, how to methylate DNA. We're so as soon as we created the program, I guess it just kind of, you know, it unfolded. So at first we, we just introduced it into our practice, but, you know, then our next question was, well, can we actually test this? Um, is it, can, could we actually do a research study? Oh my gosh. Um, we were, and so, and, and so our, our first thoughts around this were, it was, you know, maybe do we, do we use the, um, you know, maybe a promise questionnaire, or do we use the the um, medical the, the MSQ questionnaire that we use in our practice, and a lot of functional medicine docs use in our practice? And should we just make this diet available on the, you know, on our Facebook page, and maybe see if people are willing to take a baseline questionnaire and a follow up questionnaire? And um, that seemed what we would be able to actually afford to do. Um, so that was our original thinking, and then we thought, well, geez, we you know, since homocysteine has been shown into in the literature to be a surrogate marker of DNA methylation status, maybe we could try to get a homocysteine in there. Well, if we get a homocysteine, we have to get a blood draw. Um, okay, so they're going to have to come into the office. Well, if they come into the office, you know, then do we need to do an IRB? And you know, so we just started to get into this quagmire of logistics of how do we actually see um, whether or not what we're doing is going to make a difference. Now, mind you, we had already been able to see in the patients who we were prescribing this to, because we prescribe, well, we, we actually prescribe aspects of the methylation diet and lifestyle to all of our patients, because it layers extremely well with, a, with, with whatever intervention you're prescribing. You can always pull in key methylation adaptogens, methylation-rich foods, um, as needed, or you can put, we, we've got a fairly involved plan and it's the one we used in our study and you can put somebody just on that. So we were seeing clini good clinical outcome in our practice. Um, so by and by and months later and mulling and mulling and mulling, we actually got a unrestricted grant from Metagenics. Um, and we're just really, really grateful, forever grateful and thrilled so we could, test it. And so we've just finished. The clinical arm of this is done. We're analyzing the data. I have literally have a biostatistician with me in my office today um, to start to unpack what we, uh, you know, what we've done and, and any changes that, that may have happened. So our studies just completed the clinical end. We're looking at our data now. Um, 40 participants, 20 in our in active participants, 20 controls. Um, men, 50 to 72. The reason that um, we're doing f middle age is because that's when we see those methylation changes. They're just more obvious. Um, and we decided to do men because if we are such a small study population, if we included women as well, we would have to tease out what was going on with perimenopause or menopause. And we don't have enough numbers quite to, to, to do that um, just yet, but hopefully if we see good stuff here, we'll be able to continue. So our intervention is our methylation diet and lifestyle program. We have our diet, which is very rich in methylation nutrients, 
um, and adaptogens, low glycemic, anti-inflammatory. Uh, we recommend intermittent fasting. We encourage ketosis. Um, sleep, uh, we're tracking sleep. Uh, we're, we have an exercise prescription, very simple, um, just to hit an intensity of 60 to 80 percent maximum perceived exertion at least five days a week for 30 minutes. We are using Cleveland Clinic's Stress-Free Now app, um, and it has a variety of stress reduction techniques on that, and we're, ask, we're asking participants to, to do it twice a day, to use it twice a day. We have a supplemental methylation adaptogen. It's basically a green powder um, that has loads of those you know, beautiful polyphenols that we think are really going to help nourish and balance the um, methylome. We're also prescribing a probiotic, Lactobacillus plantarum. It has, plantarum has been shown to be able to make, certain plantarums have been shown to be able to make folate. Um, maybe that will happen. Uh, we also want, we just want to tend to the, the microbiome given its uh, important role in epigenetic expression. Here's our overall dietary prescription, or excuse me, principles. And you can see we've got lots of prebiotic and probiotic antioxidants. It's anti-inflammatory. Um, we're recommending optimal hydration, caloric excess. You know, I want to say, in case I don't mention it, we've got an amazing team of nutritionists who were nutrition slash coaches in this study. And it's a rigorous diet and the lifestyle component is involved. And so to just really support the men in um, in doing the study, figuring out recipes, um, j just just reporting to the nutritionists how they're doing and whether they need support, et cetera. That was a huge piece of, um, I think, the success. In fact, the Health Gut Institute who ran our trial, they thought that what we were embarking on was so complex, they're actually studying us for outcome. Um, because they expected adherence to be really poor. So far, it appears that we have good adherence. We're going to see, though, as we get into the data, whether that's true or not, but some preliminary um, data suggests that, yes, we have good ad adherence. And so that in and of itself is important, um, you know, particularly around the utility of coaches. And our, I just have loads of gratitude for, for, for my nutrition team um, and a couple nutritionists, nutritionists outside of our nutrition team for stepping up on uh, for this. Okay, so here's more of our dietary principles. We, of course, we want clean, um, organic as much as possible, minimal alcohol, uh, no folic acid fortified foods. Um, here's a list of some of the superfoods we've identified that we would like people to consume on a daily basis. These are methyl donor rich. Some of them have methylation adaptogen properties. Uh, here's some of the breakdown of our methylation superfoods, why we love them. You can see daikon or you can see shiitake, but they not only have methyl donors, but they also have that those, those methylation adaptogen properties. Um, this was a uh, study from 2015. It's just being more and more recognized the power of food as a um, modulator of epigenetics. Here's a partial list of the methylation adaptogens that we know and love. Remember I talked about demethylation in the, uh, the 1011 translocase enzymes, vitamins A, D, uh, C, et cetera, all seem to uh, have an impact there as well. So not just helping methylation move forward, um, but cleaning it up as well. And then here's some background in cancer, actually active studies going on now in humans. Uh, and again, I spoke about genistein earlier. Um, Genistein has that just extraordinary ability in depending on your, you know, the time point to, it appears to have adaptogenic prop, it, it appears to be, a, be able to behave as a methyl donor as well as, you know, an adaptogenic um, intervention. It's a little bit of background on the power of EGCG that you can, um, that you can look at. Again, allowing for the re-expression of uh, tumor suppressor uh, genes. The bulk of our, our research has been kind of spent in cancer, but we have looked beyond that. And again, again, curcumin.
just really cool stuff. Um, Queer Satan. There, you know, I'm I'm not getting them in getting into it in this particular lecture, um, but you know, there's some suggestion that synthetic folic acids. We've all been this, you know, any of us who's who, who've been consuming processed grain, which, you know, that's probably most of us at some point in our life, and that folic acid exposure, um, you know, pushing cancer forward, um, promoting perhaps tumorigenesis in some cases. And I know a lot of us in our space think it's because it's synthetic folic acid and um, we're not activating it well. But in fact, um, it's shown that folic acid can promote DNA methyltransferase activity um, and push hypermethylation forward. So um, I don't, it's not the synthetic, the synthetic piece is a is a is an is a potential issue, but I don't think that I I I I I would argue against it being the synthetic status of it being the primary driver of its ability to um, hypermethylate. And again, here's the looking at diendylmethane um, and sulforaphane. Here's um, the mechanism, some of the mechanisms of its um, activity there. So it's not these are these nutrients aren't behaving like the demethylating drugs. They just they seem to be more specific, more nuanced. I mean, of course, more research is necessary, but it's just really pretty exciting. Now, I think I need to wrap up here. Let me just you'll have all of these. You can reach out to me, but I think we need to move into our Q&A here soon. Is that right, Lenore? Yes, yes. Okay. All right. So let me just dance through the end. I just, here's an example of our rotation menu. Um, we are, so just to point out for some of the study outcome measures, we are going to, we are using a, we are measuring the methylone. We're using a, an array from Illumina called EPIC, which measures, you know, over 850,000 CPG sites. Um, plus we'll be looking at SAM, SA, we'll be looking at the methylation um, profile. Um, and then we're using a whole bunch of um, validated questionnaires. We'll be looking at the epigenetic clock. I'm very excited about this. This is a whole nother talk, uh, so I won't spend much time here, but you can certainly read about it. It's a new study. We have lots of appreciation for um, the people who've, who've walked with us on this journey and helped to make this possible. And so if you're interested in it, we, there's a 30% coupon. So if you want to hop on our website and grab a copy of the book, we've got um, a lecture series that we delivered to Cleveland Clinic uh, that you can grab. There's also some free stuff. There's recipes on the website if you go to our recipe page. So there's, there's all sorts of stuff there. All right, Lenore, let me, um, let me answer some questions. All right, perfect. Thank you so much for such a wonderful, great presentation. Um, I do want to remind everybody that the presentation of recording as well is going to be available along with the slides uh, within about a week of our broadcast date through our live GDX webinar archive page. So we did receive quite a few um, clinical questions. Um, first off, one of the major topics that we had a lot of questions about is with regard to hyper methylation. Yeah. Um, okay. Specifically, is it is it a negative thing? Uh, we do know that there's a factor in Alzheimer's disease. Um, you did mention things about inhibition. Um, if you could just elaborate just a little bit more yeah, on sure the will. idea of hypermethylation, that would be awesome. Yep, let me jump in. So first of all, for people who are studying Walsh, who talks about um, hyper and hypomethylation, he, so when I originally, when I showed you that bio, when I distinguished between metabolic methylation and then genetic methylation, I think he's talking about something happening sort of in the metabolic region. And um, that is not, it, that that is not what I'm talking about. I'm actually not super familiar. I don't understand the mechanism that, or the mechanisms that he's, you know, when he uses hyper and hypo, hypomethylation, I don't quite um, um, get it. But in 
uh, genetic methylation, um, we, we know that hyper and hypo happens all of the time. I mean, it's actually a normal thing. It, you know, a gene is inhibited or a gene is turned on. And one of the fundamental ways we do that is through popping methyl donors onto the, or popping a methyl group onto, you know, that CPG region. Um, so, you know, if it's NF kappa B, you probably want it inhibited sometimes, right? You want you don't want inflammation upregulated. So hypermethylation of, of NF kappa B to you know downregulate inflammation inflammation is is a good thing. I mean, obviously sometimes we need inflammation if we're fighting an infection, um, but really most of our chronic diseases are, you know, inflammation is a major player and arguably we want to be inhibiting it. So the hypermethylation in that case would be seen as, you know, very beneficial. Hypermethylation of a BRCA gene, however, is, is not good because then your risk for, for, for developing a cancer that, you know, BRCA otherwise suppresses, and usually those are hormone sensitive camper, cancers, can, you know, increase. So it's not... And it's, it's not an all or nothing phenomena. And that, again, you guys, is really why we took this very upstream approach that we, you know, we want to give the body the ingredients, not just the nutrients, but the lifestyle habits, you know, fresh air, clean water, community, reducing stress, plus those nutrient inputs. Um, we want to tend to the microbiome. Actually, I didn't even talk about it here, but you know, mitochondrial health is exquisitely important in healthy DNA methylation. So it's this full systems approach um, that will allow the body to really make those decisions. Uh, and, and also, you know, I'm not pushing methyl donor supplements, supplements to the same extent that I used to. I do use them. Actually, I prescribe them a lot, um, but I'm not going as long term or perhaps as high dose as I used to, particularly if I'm concerned, you know, that there, you know, there's any risk or if there's an active cancer or if there's risk of. So the other question that we received is, which methylation adaptogen green powder were you referring to specifically? Yep. 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 I'm used, so I, it's Phytoganics from Metagenics. And the um, Lactobacillus plantarum um, is also from Metagenics. Another question we received is, why specifically that species of lactobacillus. I know you mentioned something about it can help produce folate, but was there another reason why that specific species is being used? Yeah, I think there's some nice research on that particular strain, you know, just being beneficial for a wide variety of indications. Um, it was kind of like the most bang for our buck. I wanted to be very mindful that I wasn't leaning on supplements, you know, that I, I, I wanted to keep this, this a broad upstream, you know, diet and lifestyle approach. So I just, I, I, it's, it's, it's a good generalist probiotic and there, and it may be able to make folate. Well, thank you. In the interest of time, um, we will end our question and answer period there. So for additional education materials, uh, uh, please uh, visit our website, www.gdx.net, and or contact client services. Uh, we do offer complimentary appointments with our medical education specialist to answer questions related to our testing, including choosing the right test and reviewing uh, patient test results. Finally, we'd like to encourage you to register for the upcoming webinars on www.gdx.net. Next month, we will have Dr. Thomas Williams providing an update on supplementing with the right dietary nutrients and several dynamic speakers and topics to follow in the upcoming months. Um, I wanna thank you so much, Dr. Fitzgerald. That was such um, an engaging, a wonderful and enlightening presentation, really just combining the importance of lifestyle and other things that really influences methylation. Um, so again, thank you so much. And you know, please uh, do not, um, hesitate to visit the website, uh, Dr. Kara Fitzgerald's website. Um, she did provide a wonderful discount code for the ebook as well. And again, if you have additional questions, you can always contact Genova Diagnostics. Again, thank you so much, Dr. Fitzgerald. It's been wonderful. Great. Yeah, my pleasure.